Hello, people. Uh, my name is Samuel. I'm a cloud engineer at Stacked Cloud, working in compute-related topics. And I'm Maxime. I'm also working at the Stacked Cloud, but in the connectivity team. And today we we'll tell you about our story from Queens to Yoga in one migration, which definitely did not take only 20 minutes. Um, but short, uh, first a few words uh, about us. Oh, nice PowerPoint. Works very good. Ah, nice. Um, the second cloud is a part of the Schwarz Group. Um, most of uh, you guys coming from Europe maybe know the Schwarz Group. Uh, the Schwarz Group uh, consists of many uh, 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 production facilities, baking goods, ice cream, coffee. We do waste management and recycling. But most of us know us for our retail brands. Basically, we are part of the Schwarz Group is Kaufland and Lidl. Um, but we also uh, are also uh, a cloud. Okay, and I'm going to give you a little context on uh, what we were doing at the beginning of April last year. So we migrated our deployment tool for OpenStack from our old provider to our own written uh, open source tool uh, called Yahoo. And now we have a nice config management, also we have a nice lifecycle management. Um, we have the possibility to upgrade our OpenStack releases with our new, uh, life, with, uh, with our new tooling. But um, we didn't upgrade our OpenStack release when we migrated our, uh, our tooling, so we are still stuck on OpenStack Queens. And uh, now the big question, sure, why should we upgrade and how should we upgrade? Um, why is pretty easy. We want lots of new features, uh, especially compute features. We want AMD SEV, we want virtual TPMs, uh, UEFI boot, uh, all that stuff. Uh, we want to con um, leverage all the bug fixes which were upstream, which are definitely not backported to, Yoga, uh, to Queens anymore. Um, so at the start of that uh, thing, Train was basically the latest release, uh, the oldest released um, supported. And also we want to contribute our stuff upstream, but it's very hard to contribute to Queen's EOL branch, to be honest. Um, then we thought about, okay, we need uh, at least eight updates to be somewhat relevant. Um, do we really want to upgrade them all at once? And one thing we assumed was that the combined downtime of doing every single update step by step by step is a larger downtime to do some unplanned stuff for the customer instead of doing one fixed planned migration for every customer. Um, we also will uh, only upgrade uh, Nova, Neutron, and Cinder, but I will follow up on that. We do it project by project base, and we also need to guarantee the customer that there is no OpenStack resource UID change, because all the cloud tooling, like Terraform and that stuff, would fail in that, in that case. And we also um, thought about the downtime, but we will also talk about the downtime later. And while we're on it, we also have the possibility to change some stuff. Uh, we can change uh, ML2 OVS to ML2 OVN backend, which we also planned, so we combine those two changes. And we have uh, one key benefit is we don't need to do a storage migration. We basically have the same storage backend uh, there. There's no change in the storage backend. Um, and a short over uh, overview of how our uh, clusters look like. Um, we have a central services cluster where we mostly run uh, shared services like Keystone, Glance, and uh, Panko. Uh, they are already on the, okay, to be honest, Panko is not on Yoga because I think Victoria is the latest release it even supports. And then we have our old cluster uh, running Nova, Neutron, and Cinder, which connects to these central services, which is running Queens. And then we set, uh, built a new cluster and uh, uh, placed it there, and also we added Barbican in there because we need it, um, uh, on the Yoga release. And our trick here is in, in the migration that the user shall not see from what cluster his resources are served. So we built a little component called the Project Routing Reverse Proxy. Um, the Project Routing Reverse Proxy is, uh, is written in Rust, um, and it, it uh, imposes all the public endpoints for Nova, Neutron, and Cinder. So uh, we have also the option to set a Keystone project flag, which uh, then enables maintenance mode. So the customer cannot change anything. It just returns a 503 for the customer, so we can have a little freeze time for the customer. Um, and we also, in the beginning, we thought about using Keystone endpoint maps. But the problem here is about administration. So anyone who has more permissions um, spanning um, the border of a project. So everything using the, our platform services, our Kubernetes engine, Cloud Foundry, all that stuff that does in, uh, for the user some stuff, which is bigger than a single project. Also our central portal and that's, that stuff. So that's why we built this project running Rust box and it was our, it was our first uh, dive into the Rust programming language, which was also an interesting experience. 
Yeah, and I'm going to give you a short overview of uh, what need, needed to be done uh, for, all, for this migration to happen. So first of all, we started in June last year with uh, enabling yoga on our Yaouk tooling. And afterwards, we migrated Glance and Keystone uh, step by step first because that was really nice. And then in September, we uh, created our second uh, OpenStack cluster. And in January this year, we then deployed our project routing reverse proxy uh, so the user couldn't see on which cluster his resources were. And now let's have a little bit of a deeper dive into how a migration itself works. So from a user perspective, um, we don't use uh, Horizon as a UI tool as we also serve uh, many platform services, which is the integration of self-built UI um, way easier for us. So there's a so-called Stacked Portal, which is basically our uh, UI approach. Um, in this per project of a customer, a project is also the common nominator for how resources are uh, grouped in this portal as well. So in a, uh, there's also a one-to-one -one mapping between a project, whatever you call it, in the UI and our OpenStack project. So per project we choose or the customer has then in the GUI the option to choose a maintenance window. Uh, we serve uh, 14 time slots per week, which are three hours each. We, but in these time slots, this means just three hours. In these three hours, there would be a migration. Normally, we guarantee the customer the, the downtime of its resources is less than an hour. There is seldom a time in which we exp uh, exceeded seven minutes of downtime, of total downtime from servers are down, servers are up and running on the new cluster. So this is. We said, yes, from a political standpoint, one hour max, but I think we never had one that is, came even close to one hour. To be honest, so like seven minutes is a long time already. So. And we um, said like 100, time, uh, 100 migrations per time slot just to keep uh, a limit for us. Every Friday, we fetched all this data and uh, did some pre-filtering. There's a block list um, where some certain projects were listed which we should not migrate, but sometimes the user just plugged them in. Um, then we do some sanity checks. What are the resource constraints? Do we need to, need to move some hypervisors? Do we need to add new hypervisors? What are the aggregate states? Um, how they are they used? And then we uh, deployed a migration cron job. Um, in, it's a Kubernetes cron job, and it has basically the um, selected time of the user in the following week. And uh, so once the scheduling was done, we basically had just to check if there an alert would coming in that for some kind of reasons, in the migration, which Maxim will show you uh, on the next slide, there would be a failure. Okay, so how uh, or what does the migration script actually do? It's uh, mainly, uh, it's, a, it's three parts. The first part is the pre-migration, and the pre-migration is basically checking the project existence and the region, so if it's still on the old cluster. And then we run some sanity checks, and then we enable the maintenance mode in our project routing reverse proxy uh, while we are setting the uh, maintenance flag on the project itself. And then we start to shelf off all the servers and then disabling all the routers. So that's also the point where the actual downtime of the customer starts. And now we make the actual migration part where we take like all the relevant tables from the Nova Neutron and Cinder databases and uh, fetch them, and then while we fetch them and try to move them to the new cluster, we also do some magic. For example, we change the volume service UUIDs because Cinder is using uh, the service UUIDs to know which volume, backup, snapshot, or else is located on which service. So we uh, look those up, change those. We also convert some OVS stuff to OVN stuff. For example, we change the networks, we adjust some uh, ports, for example, we change the device owner of the uh, router, uh, the internal router ports, and also we do uh, all of these schema updates manually. So if there's some change, we also apply them. And after this is done, we basically are in the post migration. The post migration consists of updating the project to the new region. Also, then we run the OVN DB sync to create all of the resources that are that need to, needs to be created in an OVN uh, setup. Uh, we also patch the OVN DB sync uh, to be ran uh, project-wise, so we give it the project ID and then it runs just for the project uh, if it's possible. And uh, after that, we enable the routers and unshelf the servers, and um, then we disable the maintenance mode. And after the unshelving of the servers, uh, basically the downtime for the customer stops, and uh, to be honest, like the part from 
shelving the servers and to, to the unshelf usually took like two minutes, three minutes, but the bottleneck was definitely the OVNDB sync, which was uh, with high load taking a lot of time and then, yeah, took some time. Um, while we are at it, uh, we also adjust the public subnet allocations uh, because we duplicated our public subnets uh, because we wanted to keep the same subnet ranges and we needed to free up the IP on the new cluster and block it on the old cluster so if you, for example, delete your floating IP, you can still recreate it in the new cluster. And uh, that's basically all the migration script. Now, the migration timeline. So we started with our own projects and some dev QA and testing stuff, which was um, just a billing label. And uh, yeah, so we started with those in January and February. And then on March, we uh, set the project routing reverse proxy to route all the new projects to the new cluster. So um, all new projects will be served on the new cluster. Uh, afterwards, in April, we did, we did the migration of all the planned customer projects. And after, I think we had six weeks of planned customers, uh, customer uh, migrations, we did all of them by ourselves uh, afterwards. And right now, we are still waiting for different uh, past projects to migrate their own stuff because they have some complex cross-project setups which need to be migrated by themselves. And uh, now, probably an interesting part, what went wrong during all of this time. So one big pain point was definitely human error and communication, because, um, for example, if you see in the meme, uh, our portal labeled their project as testing. So we assumed it was just for testing, migrated it. The portal had a short downtime, uh, but uh, afterwards it worked fine. And then, yeah, just a lot of human error mistakes, but um, yeah. The second point is uh, we, dust our, uh, we dust our neutron. So we had a testing project, uh, basically a CI, uh, which was running around 200 VMs, all in the same subnet, all in the same project. So we unshaved them all at once. And then neutron database uh, got stuck a little bit because all of the port bindings were tried to be created at once. So the database locked, uh, locked itself, and then I don't know after how many, but um, after some, the database just uh, exceeded the max statement time, and all of the VMs were like in a very weird state and needed to be cleaned up afterwards. Uh, and we also introduced an unshelf limit uh, afterwards, so we just unshelf like 20 VMs at once. The next point, uh, also OVN at scale. So we migrated to OVN and then had a very low, uh, very Sorry, very large scale, um, but for this we have a different talk. I think tomorrow from Felix, uh, he's going to tell you all about that. And then the last point is the new machine type. Yeah, which is a very generous uh, thing about all the compute stuff, which basically broke lots of stuff. Um, so I will dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, so the point here is we um, we move basically from QMO 2.11 to 6.2 at once and to Libvirt 4 to Libvirt 8 which is a huge step, and we also decided to implement some stuff like we changed the default machine type for every machine, which is like the virtual motherboard of the, of the VM, if you can imagine that. Um, Q35 works a little bit different because volumes are now attached using PCI. The problem is the default configuration of PCI lanes per virtual machine is two, but we promised the customer you can attach up to 26 volumes. That led to some issues, but it's technically only a config option Nova, so that's, that's the easiest part of it. Let me start with QMO 6.2. If you are a little bit familiar with the PCI spec, the PCI spec says if you want to detach a PCI device, you need to press an attention button. That's nice, so you can signal the OS, please uh, uh, power off this device, whatever. But the point is you also need to do this for a virtual machine, so you need to press a virtual attention button. Luckily, QMO does all this for you, but it's broken in 6.2. So you, was, you were never able to detach a volume. So you attach the volume, and Kubernetes, which runs on top of our infrastructure service, moves lots of pods with persistent volumes across, so it detaches and attaches lots of volumes, but the virtual attention button was broken. So the fix is migrate to QMO7. Okay, we migrate to QMO7, but QMO7 itself is no longer capable to live migrate from a mixed platform of QMO6 and QMO7 because there's some random RNG device missing, which is some feature. We never figured 100% out why, but the fix is, migrate to QMO 7.2. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and this, this technically works. So you can now migrate from 7.0 created VMs, basically processes running the 7.0 binary, and processes running the 6.2 binary. You can all of them migrate to 7.2. Um, yeah, lots of live migrations in this case. Uh, yeah, but live migrations is a very good point. This is the next one. Uh, we found a very nice bug in Intel CPU-based nodes. This mostly triggers if you migrate between machines with different um, speeds of CPUs. Um, it's a very nice bug. So this, these are basically the bugzilla IDs. So if you want to look it up, it's, it's, it's a horrible bug. Um, one problem is here, it's a kernel bug in this case. Um, so you could not just exchange the binary and say, OK, every live migrated VM is now created with a new QEMO binary. Um, we run Ubuntu 22. So we are normally running the 5.15 kernel. It's fixed in 5.19. So basically, we had to redeploy every single goddamn Intel-based compute node at once. <laughs> Um, which is uh, where around 400 at that stage. Um, so, and combining all of these compute-based um, side, uh, side stories, uh, this took us around two months to figure that out, while the actual migration we mentioned before was completely running at that time. So uh, lots of interesting stuff we found out here. Uh, yeah. Now I will do a little summary of all of the migrations. Um, so uh, we migrate over 4,000 VMs in that uh, time frames. Uh, now we have 6,100. I think we are even more in yoga right now, 6,600, uh, if I recall correctly. And also migrated like 3,600 projects. And during that time, we also moved over 350 hypervisors from the old cluster to the new cu cluster to provide all of these uh, compute resources because we just don't double our old cluster. And yeah, we still have uh, 5,000 uh, VMs remaining on Queens, uh, but those are from our platform services uh, regarding uh, Cloud Foundry. And yeah, now the big question, should you migrate instead of upgrading? Um, I guess probably not if you are you. Uh, for us, we have a pros and cons list. So our pros, uh, pros list uh, contains of the OVS to OVN change. So we could, uh, OVS to OVN needs a downtime. So we could just combine both, both down, downtimes to one downtime, which was a great benefit for us. Also, we don't need to do any, any storage migration, which elsewhere uh, else uh, would have taken a lot of time. And also now we are on the newest OpenStack release, um, which is Yoga, which is not the newest, but at the time we were planning it was the newest. So we also skipped like say, seven or eight releases at once, which was very nice. The cons, you need a lot of effort. So we need the project routing reverse proxy to manage all of the requests. Uh, you need the second OpenStack cluster for all of this to happen. You need like all the development and the migration script and so on. And also human error, like I said before, with the portal labeling their project as testing, you just need to be careful because there's always going to be in human error in, the uh, in that case. And you also have a downtime. So we could combine both downtimes to one, but you still have one hard downtime for the customer. And uh, that's why we decided to do it. So we are now at the end. Um, we have a talk tomorrow by Felix about running OVN at scale, which is a very interesting topic. Also, we mentioned Yaug. Yaug is an open source, uh, open stack lifecycle management, fully leveraging the Kubernetes operator approach, uh, down to already also um, containerizing everything. Um, which is uh, on Thursday by uh, Robert and Stefan. And we have also some resources if you want to uh, have some look at the uh, Yahoo Cloud. Uh, also join us on IRC if you want to. Um, so we are basically finished now with our talk. We are up for questions. And thank you for your attention. Good question. The big problem is the migration between OVS and OVN, which definitely requires a downtime. Um, and in the end, we would need a downtime for this migration anyway. Um, and knowing that, yes, we still would do it again, I guess. Maybe we would not use the project routing reverse box in Rust, to be honest. But that was also a fun story to know that. Um, but we would do it again, to be honest. Um, because the benefit of jumping eight releases plus the migration of the whole network backend made it very appealing to us. That is, but only if you combine both topics together, to be honest. So, can I, can I follow up on that? Yes. Um, Antelope is released. Yes. A lot of approaches do you anticipate taking to get from Y to A? Definitely not a migration.
So because the network backend is now finished, Yahook supports uh, upgrades. So we are running uh, Yahook supports, um, I think, around 10 OpenStack services. We are using six, uh, Keystone Glance, Nova, Neutron, Cinder, Barbican, and Ironic, which is the bare metal deployment. Um, and most of them run already on set. Um, so we will just do the in-place upgrade, which is basically uh, updating the control plane, and team, M team up the hypervisors and replacing just the containers, uh, like moving from an OVN agent con container of yoga to set. Um, takes a little bit of time, but the uh, Yahoo approach uh, does this basically automatic for you. So we will down new, now do, once um, these 5,300 VMs of the platform services are finally migrated, which we don't have any hands on, um, are done. We will also decommission the old cluster. Um, but yeah, we are currently already working on the Nova migration to uh, set and the neutral migration. So we will not just do regular updates because now the network backend hopefully stays on OVN. Uh, who was next? I think there was uh, here. Okay. Another question? Yeah, sure. The patch about the making it project scoped. I think we discussed that with the Neutron guys, but Maxim, do you know anything? Otherwise, then uh, here's the, p the guy who did it. Luca, do you know anything? Uh, the question was, will we publish the um, project scope OVNDB sync uh, patch uh, upstream? So he's <laughs> Yeah, so it's basically just removing uh, all of the lines, which is uh, admin scope. And then for something like, I think, external router ports, which is not project scoped, uh, you need to give it a admin context. So it still runs on admin context on uh, some spots, but uh, yeah, we just remove the context, uh, re we remove the admin context and gave it a context uh, scope to a project and then just adjusted it to an admin context if needed and then removed all the lines where, which, which are not needed for like project scopes. So scopes. I, would, I would summarize it as we can definitely publish this but no one will accept that in that current state. So if there is any request for that, I guess that's something you could ask tomorrow at the OVN talk as well because that goes way deeper than we did. This is a very high level approach besides the compute stuff maybe. Um, but it's the answer to the OVN DB thing. And it's also just, we did it only because running the whole OVN, if you migrate every project and then run the whole OVN, it just took too long. And that's, this downtime is because this creates the ports and all that stuff in the um, northbound database. This just is the downtime for the customer. That's why we went ahead and made this, uh, this hack to make it project scope just to reduce its load a little bit. Now here was another question. Is the question answered so far? Okay. Yeah, uh, I had a question about the, uh, so you had a uh, slide that you showed the Keystone and other services. Yeah, we can go. How that uh, upgrade process actually work? Because uh, like regarding the control planes, the compute nodes you have. You talk about like, yeah. like this basically, yeah. like our setup. So um, the upgrade itself, that is something also which is explained on Thursday in the Yauk talk, but just to summarize it, um, we have everything is containerized. Um, the compute node itself is also containerized. So we have a container which runs a Nova compute and runs Libvirt. We use some hack like GDBus to um, spawn the Libvirt process on the host space. So if you kill the container, the VM keeps running. It's a hack we stole from the OpenStack Helm. It's a very good hack, but it was for C Group V1. Um, so this is how we do it in the hypervisor. Um, just it, making it empty. The idea is always to live migrate everything away and then replacing the containers to an in-place upgrade of the container. So you basically, uh, at some point, you had some rogue uh, compute nodes that they didn't connect to any. What I'm trying to understand is that, so you have a control plane in Queens. And yes. Then, uh, so so these, are, these are two separate control planes, completely separate. These are, also there's a Nova control plane here. It doesn't even know that there's another control plane there. And both are re registered in Keystone, you're just using different region flags. So these are completely standalone control planes. So these clusters, these we call them customer facing clusters, they don't have anything in common at all. So it is basically just having two regular environments running, one with Yoga, one with Queens. Okay, yeah. so you had two environments at some point and then you migrated three. to the database. At least three because the, the central one is also running. But yes, yes. The, the idea is really take everything from left, fixing it up, and moving it over. 
It's like on, on, let me quickly go to the slide. It is basically doing this. So this is basically this migration stuff. The migration script runs on the new cluster and it connects just using an SQL port to the Queen's cluster, fetches all the tables it needs, and then puts it into the yoga database. That's why we also do schema updates and all that stuff, otherwise the data would not match. That is basically, so, it, so maybe we glossed over that, sorry for that, um, because it's a very high level uh, approach here, but the idea is we take the one existing standalone environment, take all the relevant things out of that, and put it into the database of the one. If you now go to the old cluster and do an OpenStack server show or server list, you see around 6,000 servers in stage shelf offloaded. We don't touch them anymore. Because we, also, we cannot touch them because if we do that, because we have a shared backend in the storage, if we would delete them, some cinder would delete some volumes which are used by the other cluster. So we don't touch that anymore. So that's basically how we do it. The idea is doing, a, we also thought about doing like this uh, OS migration, there's a script which basically removes everything and recreates all the resources, but the problem is that we want to keep the UIDs, and the only thing you keep the UIDs is by populating the database by yourself. Sure. That works, yes. Yeah, that, it works pretty good. They're pretty easy, so the keystone and glance for the queens ran about a uh, quarter of a year, at least, or half even longer, half a year, um, and this, this works pretty good. So if everyone understood the question, we would, so because we have in this slide beforehand, we have this uh, keystone and glance running here um, on yoga, and there's API com compatibility between the Queen's environment and the yoga, and the answer is yes, that works pretty good. They are pretty standalone. Um, yeah, so at the moment also, uh, glance is, uh, right before, so we have for glance in Yauk now built the upgrade to set and to antelope, and at some stage in the next weeks, we will just press the button and then it will upgrade itself. Sure. So you're using Yauk for your Kubernetes, but is that managing Kubernetes on bare metal or do you have some other layer there? And so what are you using for Kubernetes? Okay, it, it, um, uh, the approach is, the Yauk approach is it's called yet another OpenStack on Kubernetes. So every OpenStack service is running on, as a Kubernetes. So it's bare metal Kubernetes, yes. You could also run it on a VM, it doesn't matter. You just need a Kubernetes. Um, there is also some glue code in there, um, fetching stuff from Ironic, deploying that using config drives, joining the Kubernetes cluster, but it is just bare metal Kubernetes. And a bare metal Kubernetes worker is basically then a compute node or a gateway node, whatever you label it, because the operator watch on these labels. And then you say, hey, you're now an OVN agent, and then you get an OVN agent compute port and whatever you need. So this is, any leverage is bare metal Kubernetes, yes. So, so you're using just vanilla bare metal Kubernetes or are you using yes. some other? Okay. Yeah, it's it's kubeadm Kubernetes. Yeah, it's really vanilla in this case. I, I'm not sure if I misheard you or if you glossed over it. Are you saying that the bare metal Kubernetes is deployed using Ironic, like a standalone Ironic? Yes. Then? Okay, yeah. great. So Ironic is the tool. It's also a separate cluster. It's not mentioned here. It's a separate cluster here. Um, the It's also running a it's separate Keystone. Uh, it also runs on set currently, Ironic set, Keystone set. Um, and it just deploys the nodes and then there's, uh, in the nodes, there's a config drive script which basically runs a whole lot of stuff, installs software, and, it, 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 and it's at its last step, it fetches some um, join token from HashiVault and then joins the cluster. But that's very out of scope in this case, but we can have a talk about that later if anyone is interested. Are there any other questions? If not, then thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.